presentation and we will get started. At any point in the presentation, if anyone has any comments, because we're a small group, stop me. I want to make sure that everyone has their questions and concerns answered and I understand that there's a diversity of experience and interest in the room. So we're going to start off with Grant Forward simply because it is the simplest tool. So what I mean by simplest tool is Grant Forward to me is like the Google for funding. How many people in this room are familiar with Grant Forward? Okay, so you two get what I mean when I say that in terms of just the user interface. It doesn't get any simpler than Grant Forward. Um, when we move into other things like Pivot COS, when we move into the Foundation Center, now we're starting to play with our heavy hitters. We're doing a lot more research-based work. If you're interested in learning about those tools, you have a schedule in front of you. Just shoot me an email, come to one of my sessions. We'll go into a great deal of, of depth about how to use those particular tools, how to access them, how to set them up, et cetera. So we're going to bring up the Grant Forward database for you so that you can have a look at it. So I'm assuming everyone else in here, though, is not familiar with Grant Forward at all. Okay. So this is the Grant Forward database. I'm going to go ahead and log in. And then we're going to back up because I want to give you some information on the tool so that we understand what we're looking at. The one thing you'll notice already is that when you're, when you're trying to use Grant Forward, unlike some of our other databases, you actually do have to create a login in order to do so, okay? We know we're logged in because see where it says hi here, by the way, that is me in case I didn't introduce myself to Peter Felder. I'm the Communications and Operations Manager for the Office of Sponsored Programs. All of my information is in front of you. It is in the brochure. So you do have my direct dial and my email address there. Um, but this is Grant Forward, and to get into a little bit about what this particular tool offers and what makes it different, we're going to start here. Usually when I teach on our um, database tools, because I know a lot of our professors and students have limited time, what I try to do is to, one, cover everything that we offer at the university, um, two, go over some assumptions that I'd like to see, that, that assumptions that I'd like to bring to the forefront of people's minds just in terms of mistakes that we see in OSP that slow down applications, that slow down just the process of routing and whatnot. Um, and then also what I like to do is I like to discuss the difference between each database because there's a reason, for example, AU is really robust that a lot of universities they subscribe to one or two databases. AU has a total of four. Three that OSP manages and one that's called SciVal that's through the university. Why so robust? Well, each one has a difference. So usually I'll talk about, uh, I'll talk about the differences between each one just because I think that's an important thing to know. Today's presentation though, we're gonna fo focus on Grant Forward. As soon as this is finished loading, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about what makes Grant Forward so different, why it's the simplest thing to use, what do we mean when we say do a very basic funding search? What are some things that we mean when we say advanced search features? Um, and then I'll take any questions that you have. Again, with the understanding that Grant Forward is the easiest database that we have to utilize. And I wanna keep saying that because when you get into things like Pivot COS and whatnot, you have negative searches, different types, faceted queries, all kinds of different things, and usually I schedule one-on-ones. So a couple of things to keep in mind is the university has several resources. How many people have worked with OSP before? Okay, great. Have you two attended our trainings? I don't recall, I don't recall seeing you. I don't recall having met you before. Okay, okay. So the, the, a couple of things that OSP now offers that we may not have offered in previous years are one-on-one -on -one trainings for people who are already familiar with the tools and unit-specific and general trainings that cover utilizing all of our tools. This is the usual presentation that I would use again. My name is Akita Felder, Operations and Communications Manager, and the focus of using the tools is obviously to fund your various projects. Another thing that we cover in our one-on-one -on -one presentations are developing keywords. So for the two people who've worked with OSP before, did someone work with you one-on-one -on -one to develop? I hope they did. I did a good job. Right. And then when you worked with OSP before, did someone work with you to develop? Excellent. So that's the other thing for people new to search engines, new to Grant Forward, whatever database you utilize, before even beginning to, to attempt to dabble in databases, we need to be able to be clear about what are the keywords associated with your project. How is that project de de described in your letters of inquiry? How are funders describing your particular projects? What are the key buzzwords? Is that making sense? 
And then what you want to do is you want to have a body of about 20 words. Those are the words that we're inputting into the search funding tool. So we're not sitting down like we do when we're kind of searching Google for hot purple yoga pants or whatever. We need it to be really specific so that we've got a great usage of our time in front of us, okay? And where we're pulling those keywords from are, again, from funder websites, um, from possible funder RFPs that you may have come across, and then just from some standard terms that are familiar to your field. Getting started, the first thing I want to be clear about, since only two people in the room have worked with OSB, is what the Office of Sponsored Programs is. And so you'll see that kind of in front of you. The long and short of it is we're responsible for all pre and pre-award and non-financial post-awards functions, including submissions. Two important key things to, to, to keep in mind here. OSP is responsible for the routing of all things internally. The reason that's important is because sometimes we have things called limited submissions, which means that a funder is only going to receive one or two projects from a university. So everything has to go through a routing and an approval process to make sure the university is not disqualified because several different departments are submitting things at once. The other thing is to make sure that we're compliant, to make sure that the things that we're putting in our proposals in terms of the university's capacity are in fact um, reflective of the university's capacity. So if we say that we have faculty that has a certain amount of hours that they can work during the summer on a project, we actually have to have a checks and balances system for that. So OSP partners um, with our faculty and staff to make sure that we are compliant in those areas. Another way OSP partners, and again, I can email this to anyone who needs this detailed information, but you'll also find it in the brochure you already have, is with budget preparation. OSP will not do your budget for you. That is not what we do, but we will help perfect the budget. We will help you develop um, and flesh out your line items, and we will provide that second eye um, from people who that's what they do all day, every day, to make sure that you're the most competitive that you can be, because obviously that's a part of putting together a great application package as well. Our core services, I kind of went over this a little bit, assistance with budget proposal preparation and development, um, initiate sponsored award account setup, again, that's the routing process, um, and then hosting regular events to educate faculty and staff on sponsored related policies and procedures. You can find those events in the brochures that I've given you in terms of the training that we offer. If you're above and beyond that, let's say once we go through Grant Forward, you're like, Akita, I'm ready to go. I have a project that we need to find funding for and you have your 20 keywords. You schedule a one-on-one -on -one appointment with me. I'll either come to you or you can come to my office and we'll walk, walk through one time where we kind of go through what's available um, within your particular field. This is another key thing that I always want to bring up to people. Being at a university where we have more than one database provides an excellent opportunity for you to leverage those databases. If you're always using Pivot COS to find your funding opportunities, taking those same keywords and filtering them through four other databases may in fact uncover some new funders. Does that make sense? Also utilizing some other key strategies, a lot of people don't think about this, but um, Google has something called a keyword tool planner. If you put your keywords into that, it'll start to kind of play with your keywords and give you some input of how a computer sees your keywords. Then entering that into the three databases that we manage may also uncover additional funders. So that's the kind of keyword strategy that we go over in the one-on-one, just to make sure that you are in fact exhausting the funders that are applicable to your field. Again, OSP does a variety of different things. The main things, though, are budget proposal and assisting with electronic proposal de um, development and then our educational events such as today. Does anyone have any questions specific to OSP or the services that we offer before I get into Grant Forward? No? Sure. So um, what kind of support um, have you or do you provide to uh, filmmakers who want to produce a documentary? Absolutely. I actually had the privilege of working with SOC. We actually did a one-on-one -on -one unit specific, which you were there for. Um, um, presentation and so what we do is exactly what I just said so we come we go over the funding databases we do one-on-one -on -one sessions with professors or stat students that are interested we'll come up with your keywords we'll start to do funding opportunity um, searches for you I myself because I have a master's in media studies am a member of women in film they send out development pieces um, in terms of financing opportunities to me all the time I forward them to Christy and Laura all the time um, so that she can disseminate those to the staff and so that's pretty much what we do. Another thing that we also do is um, in our monthly newsletter, I don't know if you're a subscriber to it, 
but um, on a monthly basis, we do put out funding opportunities that our staff has uncovered for you without you having to do any work specific to communication, specific to filmmaking. If you want to get more specific, depending on the subject matter, where you're going to be shooting, you know, um, is it an equipment need or what have you, that's when we really need to get into the search funding tools and then the support we would provide for that are the training. Um, and then again, to kind of speak to your question, a lot of people say, um, you know, well, what are the two sessions about general versus individual? General is just that, we're gonna go over funding tools. Specific to your question though, if you, for example, sent me a film treatment, you said, Akita, I'm looking to do something with women in India, um, I'm looking for technology, we're really looking to buy cameras at this particular point, I would take a, a grouping of your keywords, plot them in for you to see what I could find. And then once I came up with about a list of maybe let's say 25 funders, I'd send them to you and say, okay, now you need to go through the funders, pull out the language that they're using to describe your project, and then we go at it all over again. That's the hardest work. I mean, to me, that's kind of where the weed, weed is separated from the chaff. Everyone gives up right, right at that angle because it, there is no easy way around it. That's the work, folks, okay? But we will support you every step of the way, though. We really will. And I love doing it, especially when it's communications related because it gives me an excuse to say I was involved in something. So feel free to call me. Um, so today's goal, we're not gonna go over all three. We're gonna go over Grant Ford. The first thing is you can access Grant Ford right there, grantford.com. You would need to obviously create a um, login access. You'll see that right there. There are two types of searches that you can do in Grant Forward. Again, this is our most basic tool. So with that being said, basic and advanced searches are the two types of searches that you can do. For those of you who just walked into the room, the user interface looks exactly like that. Um, again, you'll see the URL right there. And you would need to create a user, lo a user login, which is why you see my name, Akita, good to meet you, right there. And what I mean by basic and, and advanced, just so you can, you can see what I mean, is right here, basic, we just do a wild card search. We put a keyword in there and see what popped up. Or um, what we would do is go down here and we'd start to play around with our more advanced functionalities, which are right there. Before we skip to the user interface, though, I'd like to do a complete overview. So what do I mean by advanced? So in terms of um, Grant Forward, advanced means having your keywords, keywords that we've already talked about, um, filtering your funding opportunities by categories and subcategories, which are already there, so this is not like a lot of guesswork that you'd have to do, they're predefined that you can utilize. Using advanced filters, advanced filters would be things like sponsors, sponsor type, and deadline. Um, I'd like to point out, I think for any of the tools that we have, deadlines are essential not just because, oh my God, I have a film that I'd like to produce in the next year, but we really want to get people to a proactive way of thinking, right? So you want to start to plan for your entire year, not just based on projects. So if you know that a summer's coming up, you're going to have some free time, that's the best time then to start to plan until the next summer. What you don't want to be, um, what you don't want to do is be in a constant state of reaction because the work that you have to do to one, find, find sponsors, and then two, pull competitive applications together. You always just kind of want to have one thing coming after the next as a, as a rule of thumb, um, not necessarily for just kind of reaction by project base, because there may be monies out there, deadlines may not coincide with which you want to do filming, for example, so you want to just have that going. The other thing, too, that I would recommend is find a mentor in your department who has been funded and really try to develop those internal um, relationships. I know I work with Chris Palmer a lot, a lot, as does Shira. Um, so these are great people to know, and I think I mentioned that when I came to SOC, um, because you want to see how is it that they're planning their year, their, their funding year. And you'll find that although AU has a number of information silos, for people who are actually interested in work, people aren't not sharing the structure of how they get their work done. They may not say, well, these are my 50 funders, right? But they'll tell you, well, this is how I plan, or this is the calendar that I use, or these are the busiest times for me during the year, you know? And those basics, you can kind of customize what'll work for you depending upon your interests, your background, et cetera. Another two features of the advanced functionality of Grant Forward are saved searches and alerts, hence why you need to sign up for your own personal account because once you've filled out your researcher profile, once you've put in your keywords, then you can simply do a save search and have alerts hit your AU account throughout the year that kind of reminds you, okay, is this something I'm interested in? Is this something I wanna to apply to? Again, it goes back to the notion of having a financial calendar throughout the year, not just by project. And then the other piece is the saved favorites. That's the last um, advanced functionality. 
Um, state favorites is important because, for example, K. Fritz Foundation is a pretty general limited submission foundation for the university, but it's broad in terms of the various interests. So like a filmmaker could apply for K. Fritz, someone from hard sciences could apply. You just have to prepare for it and have a competitive project. So again, it goes back to planning because had you had you known that November was the time K. Fritz Foundation was looking for something, you wouldn't have to scramble for something innovative. You'd have it on deck, ready to go, and you'd be able to participate in the internal limited submission application process. Okay, so those are the basics on um, Grant Forward. Before we get into kind of exploring the user interface a little bit deeper, did anyone have any questions about anything I've discussed thus far? Really, you guys are just gonna be easy on me with that? This is great. Okay, so when we look at Grant Forward, this is the user interface. Um, you can search two ways. One, you can go to clearly where it says keyword, or you can simply go here and do and, and conduct your searches from here. You'll notice saved searches are there, recommended searches, favorites. Once you go in and create your profile and you've inserted your keywords, your background, your education, the system starts to customize itself to you. So what does it mean by you know recommendations? Well, if you've input some information into the system, clearly it can start to recommend things to you. To you. Right now, if you click on recommendations, and for example, I'm not a researcher, anything is gonna come up because you see I haven't filled out you know, anything because I don't conduct research for myself. I just simply put it in and conduct for other people, absolutely. Going back to where it had profile? Sure. Um, because I didn't do the search, but when I did the profile, you can upload your CV. You can, your entire CV. And if you upload it in Word, what happens was it creates a whole little uh, word, word cloud, cloud yeah. and then it just starts searching by itself. And, that, and I think that's an important um, illustration of what I mean by once you input the information, the computer really does partner with you and start to recommend things to you very intuitively. It's almost, um, for people who are familiar with SEO and contextual ads, once Google gets a sense that you like, you know, red pumps or, you know, Stacey Adams shoes, you start seeing them everywhere, you know what I mean? This system operates the same way. Once it knows that you're looking for film funding or once it look, knows that you're looking for a different kind of funding, it starts to customize itself to you. The, the more information, though, that you input into your profile as you're creating it, the more specific results you're gonna get. The only time, though, that I, I caution people about that is let's say that you are a filmmaker and your interests are varied, then you don't want to just input things about environmental filmmaking because that's all that's going to come up in terms of your search. So if you're interested in more broad related subjects, filmmaking in general, or women in film, or you know Australian film or whatever, then you want to keep it as broad as you can and then go specific as per project. Does that make sense? Because if you get too specific, then you're only going to see 20 results or so out of a possible 70 that you've missed, okay? Um, so again, when we look at profile, my profile, just to kind of give you a feel of what's going on there, you'll see that the basics are there. I mean, if you want to, you know, include your, your photo, feel free. I'm not the most photogenic, so that's not happening. Um, but you can definitely upload your resume. You can definitely upload um, your educational background. Um, you can definitely upload your research interests. I recommend uploading your biography because there may be things in your resume that are not necessarily um, things that would be in a biography, so that gives the computer a little bit more information to work with. But again, do you see what I mean by this? this is a very simple, intuitive tool. This is really not super deep. Where we're getting into a level of depth would be Pivot COS, would be the Foundation Center, which is more so for educational um, research on foundations and that kind of thing, and researching companies that may be giving out some information. But Grant Forward really just is a great tool for getting your feet wet in the whole search funding tool. Once you're comfortable with this, a seamless transition to Pivot COS will be a really easy for you because you'll be familiar with some of our more advanced functionalities. Um, also, you'll notice where it says co-authors, who people have also uh, viewed recommended grants at the bottom. When you fed into the system what you need to feed into it, all those things will be populated specific to your particular interest. Someone had a question? Did you have a question? A brief question. Sure, sure, sure. And um, it doesn't have to be brief, so take your time. Can you upload a, uh, a website? You, a you website? actually can. Yep. Yep. You can put your website up there, too. Um, the only thing about the website, so usually with a website, for example, um, when, spider, when Google spiders are crawling websites, they're looking for every detail so they can kind of see the code. 
Um, so the only thing I would caution against is don't upload a website only. Like if you want to put the website and the CV or your website and the bio, no, do that. No, it would be a combination. Absolutely. And the only reason I'm saying that is because once you get into the system, you'll see that some of my beloved professors simply just put in their education and a website and assumed the system would go to the website and pull all the information. It does not do that. Yeah. Um, and obviously you have um, the opportunity to edit your profile. You also have privacy settings, you know, in the event that you don't want everyone under the globe to know that you have five PhDs, you know. I don't see why you wouldn't want anyone to know that. More and more funding, so why not? Um, but you have control over your profile for people who are concerned about their information being on the internet. Um, the other thing that I like is you can view profiles. So I think that's a great thing because let's say that you don't have any idea whatsoever um, what to put on there or what to have you. You can have great ideas for what to put on there, what's necessary, how the computer is identifying people. The other thing that you can also do is you can find collaborators outside of AU, right? So Grant Ford is good for that as well. Because what if you want to work, what if your project's based in Miami and you're wondering, is anyone interested in the research that I'm doing in Miami? Well, this is a great opportunity to find collaborators as well. So there are really creative ways that you can use our, our funding um, databases as well, not just for money, sometimes for collaboration. And sometimes that means money. Like you reach out to the people in Miami, they say, we already have a grant, you put us on yours, we'll put you on ours. I mean, crazier things have happened. We see that at OSP all the time. So don't just think of it as a solely Funding, fund, funding, finding opportunity. There are many other partnerships um, that you can develop in terms of just making your network more dynamic. Do you have to make your profile public in order to search and find those people, or you can do it? They, their, their profile would have to be public in order for you to search and find them, because yours could not be public, but you'd still be able to find a public profile if they, if you desire that they be able to find you. Absolutely. I see you. I do. I see you. You have a great picture. Okay, so something else, um, just I wanted to be clear, when you log in, you create your, your profile, this is what you're gonna see. You're gonna see um, the tab that says begin building. Once your profile has been built, you can go back and edit it. You can also invite colleagues and researchers in the event that you're, you're only here solely for a particular project, you're looking for funding for one thing, um, so that you can, you can also add them there. Um, the other thing, too, that I'd also like to put, put, point out to you is two things, one, Grant Forward How To tutorial is right there. Video link is also in the brochure that you have. The other thing is tutorials right here. One of the things I do like about the Grant Forward user interface, it has nothing to do with the fact that I have a short attention span. You'll notice this right here. Most things are under two to three minutes. So like let's say after this presentation, you want to set up a profile, you want to go in there, you want to play around with it and say, well, Akita, how do I search? Well, guess what? In four minutes, it'll tell you. There's a video right here that'll walk you through. Now I can't verify for the narrated, narrated voice quality, but what I can tell you is it's accurate, um, and usually it's in under four minutes. Under you know, it's never more than really four to five minutes, um, and though that's actually quite long for it. Um, but there are plenty of um, opportunities there for you to to receive training. You'll also notice there's a training library on your left. If that doesn't work for you and you need something printable, that's also there. So there are plenty of resources here for you in terms of just figuring out um, how to utilize the database. But again, very basic. Um, really reminds me of the Google, um, the Google interface. I want you to see what the sponsor directory looks like. So let's say, for example, that you're coming into this particular tool and you say, you know what, I'm looking for a particular sponsor. If you have the name, you can definitely do it alphabetically here. Um, if it pops up here, you can definitely click there. Or if you want to search by sponsor type, and which, by the way, was one of our advanced features, what is sponsor type? It's really basic. Sponsor type is, are we looking for something federal, state, foundation, corporate, academic? Now, one of the things I do like to point out um, to people is when we say academic, um, there are a few opportunities um, that a lot of people ignore. If you are a professor and you have students that are working with you, one of the things I like, or if you're a student and you've partnered with a professor, one of the things I always like to point out is for all of our funding databases, they can be used to find postdoc money, they can be used to find um, money for your graduate studies. So it's not just free slave labor that you're in here, you know, helping your professor fund their wildest dreams. 
there's something in there for you too if you would just take the time to utilize it. I know when I was in grad school, I utilized many of our databases to find scholarships, both internationally and here. They're travel scholarships, they're conference scholarships, and so those are selling points just for any of our professors in the room, just to let your students know that it's not just about project funding, they can also find funding for their academics as well. Um, just to give you a feel for what some of the, um, some of the um, pages look like in terms of just um, our, our foundations, Again, everything is really simple. So 11th Global Cardiovascular Clinic Trialist Forum. What would we see here? This is pretty much what you're gonna see. <clears throat> you're gonna get the basics. Now, the one thing I do wanna point out about Grant Forward, which I think is amazing, it is the only, hey, how are you? It is the only tool that we currently have a schedule on, right? So they update their database twice a week. Let's say that you look at the database you don't find the sponsor that you're looking for, or you find something and you're saying to yourself, that's a little incomplete, I'd like a little bit more information. They are the only database that we utilize that actually has given us an email address and has a support team. You'll see it at support at grantforward.com. Not only will they do the research to make sure that everything is verified and that it's a little more robust, if it is missing from their database, they will take that research off your hands, do it, add it to the database themselves, just keep in mind that everyone will have access to it, but they're the only database that offers that level of support at that time. I'd like to point out they do that because they're the newest, so therefore they're looking for your business, um, they're looking for the university's business, but I think that that's a great thing, especially if you're, you know, if you have 10 or 15 different sponsors, you don't have a lot of information, or maybe you were at a conference, you overheard some names, you didn't find it when you looked them up alphabetically, throw that on the team, they're a grant forward, they're getting paid to do that, and then just follow up in a couple of weeks to make sure that it's been inserted. I think that's a great selling tool for, for that particular database. Back to the um, user interface, did anyone have any specific questions on advanced functionalities or how to do a search? Is there anything about grant forward that you're not clear about? I mean, they have been so good to me. I mean, not even one question. I mean, they're just nodding. I don't know whether they're awake or what's happening. But no one has any questions for me? Ask them to do a search. Okay. Well, does someone want to come up and try a search? Everyone just got really quiet. I felt them like recoil <laughs> when you did that. I felt that was a teacher. They recoil. Um, did anyone want to try a search? Really? No adventurers in the building? Really? No one. Okay. I'll try this. Okay. What am I going to do? Let's see. Draw out a word for me. Brave. Brave soul. Um, it's going to be a history project. Okay. Uh, Vietnam. Okay, let's try that. At least to be able to spell. So I want to show you something. Because um, because we just entered a very general term, and you'll notice when you come up with your keywords, the reason we said they need to be specific and you need to pull them from your letters of inquiry, from the funders, um, websites, etc. You're going to get a lot of hits. Now, this is actually a beautiful thing that you just did because it, it enables me to show you a couple of different things. So you see where it says June the 2nd there? The first thing that I'd like to, I'm, I'm a lover of technology, but I'm not a truster of technology. And let me explain what I mean by that. Just because you see a deadline there does not mean that that deadline has been updated in any database. So I would never go off of that. That's a great kind of general idea. But what you always want to do then is go to the organization's website itself to make sure that there's been no change. No change in the deadline, and most importantly, no change in the programmatic funding focus. Does that make sense? So those would be just some general habits and general assumptions. Don't assume just because you see a deadline, that's what they're going with. That could have been from last year. Now, because we know that we're looking at Grant Forward and they update twice a week, that's probably not from last year here. But if we were looking at Foundation Center or Pivot POS, I would definitely not go off of that information. Does that make sense? Okay. Also, To use, to use just the term that you gave, and I appreciate that, you'll notice that there's a link to the app, um, application form here, right? And that takes you to the Grants GOV site. You'll also notice this page is a lot more robust than the one we originally saw, so I think this is a great thing to utilize. Another function that comes up because of what you suggested was the export function. I think that that's key, because if I found 50 different opportunities, you don't just have to export those one at a time yourself, you can have them all exported. Um, from the particular system. You'll also notice the favorite star button that's the stairs one, and I'm sorry if you can't see it. Once you've created your login, 
You can simply hit favorite. And then again, once you've aggregated 50 opportunities, export into Excel, because that's what I would do had you contacted me about the film piece. I would export 50 opportunities and then send them to you and say, okay, now it's time for you to use your expert eye and see what's applicable to your project or not. Another thing that you'll see here, because this page is a lot more robust, is the description. Um, with something that says, you know, show more and submission deadline. Another thing that you'll notice is eligibility. These are things that you do need to pay attention to. Is it restricted? Is it unrestricted? With some funding, they'll say, you know, you have to be a citizen of Thailand or do you have one U.S. citizen? Those are some key details that you'll want to keep in mind. With anything, when in doubt, when in doubt, go to the funder's website. Okay, so again, to me, I view this as kind of the cliff notes of the book. This is the cliff notes, but you always want to go directly to the funder website. Um, going a little bit more specific, when we click on opportunity source, I, and I just wanted to point this out because I mentioned Grants GOV earlier, you'll notice this is the URL, Grants GOV. If you're not familiar with Grants GOV, please become familiar with it. Um, it it's going to save your life to have some familiarity with that before working with OSP. But when you go to Grants GOV, Use GOV, you see the entire application now available to you, and now we're getting into the nitty gritty of what this process is really going to look like. Okay, so the funding database, that part is a lot of fun, but now we're getting to okay, this is the application where you're being told specifically what are the posted dates, created dates, what is the closing date for the application, which in this case we do find is, is June the 2nd, so that's great, we weren't lied to. But in many instances, um, that's not the case, so you do need to double check, okay? And then you see what the award ceiling is and what the award floor is. I think that's really important, especially if you're looking for, let's say you're looking for a million dollars. Well, this might not work for you um, if, if they're only making, if they're making 50 awards, right? If they're making one or two, maybe it works for you. So those are key things to keep in mind. And then eligibility, which we mentioned a little bit earlier. This gives you a little bit more information on that. So again, once you're off the funding tool site, that's where you're gonna get your robust information about the opportunity. So is that clear to everyone? Does that make sense? I don't know, I'm getting a lot of nods. Is that yes? Is that yes? Okay, okay, good, good. So did anyone else have any questions for me? No? Thank you very much for your assistance. I appreciate it. Of course. You were the bravest person in the room. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, so that pretty much is Grant Forward. I mean, it, it really is that simple. We're putting in keywords. We're going to sponsor websites. Um, if you've never used Grants GOV, we have specialists in the Office of Sponsor Programs that will walk you through that process. I'm going to repeat myself because I know someone misunderstood me and heard me say that we do it for you. That is not what I said. What I said is we will walk you through and we will partner with you through that process. Um, and then we'll also partner with you through the electronic submission process throughout the university to make sure that you're in compliance every step of the way and that you have the university's correct position statements um, in your documents every step of the way. So did anyone have any questions? Yes, ma'am. I know we focus on Grant Forward today, but could you suggest another website that you really like or is very popular or, or you know? Absolutely. Couple? Do you have the brochure that I handed no, out? I okay, cool. So let's make sure. Does anyone not have the article or the brochure? Okay. Thank you very much, Gavin. I appreciate that. And does anyone not have the article? Oh, okay. All right. Gavin, I didn't know you were going to turn into a worker here. I'm, well, yeah. Thank you so much. I just am so tough, grateful. Tough community works. Absolutely. Thank you. Does anyone else over there need the article? Yeah. So since we have a little bit of time, um, what I would like to do is for everyone to kind of look at the article for me. Usually in our training, what we do is we cover point number three, which is getting to know the funding sources. So we did that in a very micro fashion today by getting to know Grant Forward. To answer your question, because I don't want to skip over it, if you look in the brochure, you'll notice that there are links to video tutorials to absolutely all the databases that OSP manages. There is one other database that OSP does not manage. It's called SciVal, and it is um, accessed through the library. You can access it by going to the library's website. You'll notice a tab that says Search Databases. You'll go to the letter S, and then you'll go down to SciVal. And then we'll go from, you know, you'll go from there. Anyone at the circulation desk would be able to kind of tell you how to work that. I found that that's really great for, you know, sciences. It's really great for projects that have more international implications. Um, if you have collaborators in other parts of the world, it's really great to help them find funding that way. Um, now, that's been my limited exposure to that. The other three that we utilize in OSP um, would be Pivot COS, the Foundation Center, and then Grant Forward. So when you say, uh what does that mean exactly? I'm not 
Sure, so what happens is all of the training that has to do with the databases, um, any issues that come up with the databases, helping people get set up and developing scholar profiles or researcher profiles, that would be something a part of my functionality within OSP. So I would manage those processes. You'll also notice training dates um, in your brochure as well for the remainder of the year. I believe some are coming up in February. If you're interested in being exposed to on a more in-depth level of some of our um, funding tools that are a little bit more advanced than um, and when I say advanced, meaning people in hard sciences or people who are, whose research is, is very clearly defined, they really need something that's not as general as Grant Forward, and so Pivot COS and the Foundation Center provide two different ways for us to approach finding funding, um, and we kind of talk about that in the sessions that I offer there. We kind of get into, well, you know, how do we utilize Board of Trustee information um, in order to develop relationships, in order to get, you know, funding and developing relationships with program officers and that kind of thing. Um, but primarily, if you look at the article, we usually f focus on point number three, which is getting to know our funding resources, and that information is in the brochure that you have. <laughs> Did anyone else have any questions for me before I kind of touch base on this? Okay, very quickly, I always include um, top 10 tips on how to get funding, because I think when you come to any presentation where we've covered tools, that's great, and you've been introduced to a tool, but as I said to some of you who were here earlier, what is better to me is for you to have an approach to finding funding. Because you can go online and find a funder, but if you don't know how to approach the funder, if you're not familiar with where you're, you know, how they speak and you don't know how to speak in their language, um, when you're applying for federal grants, if you're not familiar with NSF and you don't know what their applications look like traditionally, um, if you don't know what a strong package looks like to them, well then we need to pause before we even begin um, that process. For faculty and staff who are involved on the federal side, um, and how many people would that be here who, who apply for federal funding but who would be faculty or staff for American University? How many people in this room? Okay. Are you already familiar with Ralph and Louise? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So um, for people who are not familiar with Ralph and Louise, the university has um, two consultants that will also work with um, faculty and staff who are applying for federal grants. And Louise really will also work with people who are applying for private and foundation grants as well to help you perfect your packages. If you are working with a professor, it is possible that she may partner with you through that professor's work as well. So that's something to keep in mind because many of the professors may not be aware that they have those two um, paid resources here to help them. For everyone else, you're more than welcome to partner with OSP. You're more than welcome to give me a call directly. There's several different opportunities locally. For example, the Foundation Center has an office on K Street. For students, I would definitely advise that you pay them a visit. Why? Because the university itself um, subscribes to their professional database, but the Foundation Center also maintains something called an individual database. Is anyone here familiar with the individual database? By show of hands, no one? Okay, so that may be relevant to film projects as well. The individual database is just that groupings of monies that organizations are willing to give to individuals. It doesn't get any better than that. So there are only two ways that you can access that, one by going to their office on K Street, or if you recently received a raise and you have $19.99 to spend per month, you may subscribe to their services and access them online via their website. But I like to tell more people about that, that database because many people aren't familiar that there is actually a database of funds that go directly to individuals. You don't have to be aligned with a 501c3. Um, obviously, if you don't do the work, they will come get you. I will point them in your direction. Uh, and But you, know, you need to know that those resources are out there. But to go over the article very quickly, um, you want to decide whether you want to go after external funding, right? So what do we mean by that? A lot of people aren't familiar with the fact that their departments have internal funding opportunities available. Many people never approach their deans and say, well, you know, is there funding for my project? I mean, if you're looking to do something small, if you need, you know, 500 and under or 1,000 and under, there may be some seed money available in your department. So you want to cultivate the right relationships um, so that you can ask and request for those, that, those monies. If you are faculty or staff, there is definitely that kind of money for your research. So that's just a matter of having a conversation with your dean and finding out what that competitive process is. If you find, though, that, you know, hey, I'm not going to be able to make my next Steven Soderbergh film off of $500, it'd be great if I could, but I can't. So now we're looking at external funding. That's when we're going to go to the databases, all three of them, and we're going to simply try to find as much information as we possibly can. The other thing that we would, I advise doing 
is joining all of the professional organizations that you can, Women in Film, TIVA, because they have a lot of scholarship or developmental film funding money. So in your specific, specific um, profession, what are the organizations and do they have monies for projects? Um, and so those are kind of some of the things that you want to want to um, decide. I like number two, make yourself valuable. The reason I like it is because how are you going to go into an online funding database and put in a, a biography if you have not determined what your level of expertise is? Why are you special? What do you know? You'd be amazed how many people come and sit in my office and they tell me they want to do some groundbreaking innovation, innovative research, and we talk, and I say, well, great, but what makes you different from the other 50 people across the globe and they don't have any idea? So know what that is. Is it that you spent you know, most of your life in Africa? I did. You know, is it that you spent, speak three languages? I do. Figure out what makes you shine because those are the kinds of things that should be in your application. Those are the kinds of things that your team should know about. Those are the kinds of things that should be, if you're multilingual, that should be in your biography. Because as a funder may want to fund, like if, if your application is competitive, and mine is too, but I speak Shona, Portuguese, French, and English, and you speak English, but other than that, we're neck and neck. Well, if I've given these little tidbits, then they may go with me, unless you're related to someone or you're just prettier, I don't know. But the point is you want to put in all this information because you never know what the peer review committee is looking at in terms of all that information. So figure out what makes you shine, figure out what makes you special, figure out what makes you an expert in your field. On a more serious note, is it that you have citations? You know, have you been published? Okay, have you written with some of the top people? Have you worked with some of the top people? Are you the top person in your field and you're simply cited everywhere? Then that's something that we would need to know. And that's another thing that I run into a lot. We have some really humble faculty members. Like I had a, I won't call that person out by name, but I had someone come into my office, then the person actually said, I've been doing this for 15 years. And I'm like, please tell me that's not why you, you feel like you're special. Everyone cites you in your field. And the person said, what? Yeah, that is true. You know, so don't be modest. If you are a leader in your field, then you need to put that information in your biography. Definitely that's not the time to be shy, you know, when you're applying for federal funding or when you're filling out your scholar profile, okay? And even as a student, for example, if you've been able to receive some kind of funding, that's impressive as a graduate student. Or if you've spoken at NIST or you've conducted some kind of leading presentation somewhere, well, if everyone else was on summer break and you were doing some research working with the top minds in your field, that's something that should be present in your biography, okay? So those are things that um, I think are important because that just makes, it gives the computer more information to work with and more information to pull from when you have a robust and a professional biography and a CV that's really been thought through, not just checked off. Like I hate seeing CVs that are checked off, like PhD check, master's degree check. So, like why did you choose to go where you went? Did you study abroad? Who were your teachers? You know, what did you read? Um, so you want to make sure that you're including that information. Number four, I've touched upon it on several occasions. Get to know the key people. You are in Washington, D.C. So the Foundation Center's office is here. You need to be there. Who are those people? If you need help developing writing proposals, who can you reach out to? They can refer you to people. We have centers on the campus that can help you and possibly refer you to people. You have a wealth of academic knowledge. Those people have relationships with program officers. They, they've been there, done that. They may have applied for federal funding. Just because they weren't funded doesn't mean they can't tell you what that program officer is looking for or what they could have done to keep their language a little bit better. But you will never get an answer to a question that you fail to ask. So please make sure that you're asking those key questions. Get to know the community. I've touched upon this. You should be presenting. Are you presenting in local, present, in local professional organizations? Are you presenting here on campus? Are you videotaping these things? Are there photos? Do you have a portfolio? Again, this goes back to your specialness. People tease me all the time, but a student or a postdoc coming to, to NSF with a portfolio of presentations all over the globe specific to their interests versus someone who just has an inkling that they want to get started this year, who are you funding? You're funding the person with the proven track record, but no one is tracking your record. So I definitely advise that you do that as soon as possible. Number six, submit your first few grants with senior colleagues. To me, this is crucial. Even as a student, if you have a project, maybe your mentor or a professor would be interested in adding their name to your application.
application. You don't have a PhD, they've had theirs for 15 years. Leverage, leverage people, leverage. But no one likes to do that. We approach our professors for letters of recommendation, but we're not thinking about them in terms of partners for funding. So develop those key relationships beyond letters of recommendation. Actually take it into the professional atmosphere. Be useful to them the way they're being useful to you currently. Um, write well and have a focus. I think that goes without saying because when they're reading your applications, on all honesty, at, with the stacks of applications they have, they're looking for reasons to throw your app in the trash. You know, so like if I read through something in the first paragraph, I, it's not riveting. I'm not moved. You're confused. You don't know where you're from. It's going in the trash. And that's the mindset that you need to be writing with, right? So I'm not saying that it should be a sizzle reel. That's not what I'm saying. But your research should be interesting. You should be able to describe it in a concise way. And if you can't, then maybe you need to rethink applying until you can. Um, going on to the next side, ask for feedback. If you're not faculty, you don't necessarily have access to the consultants that we have, but OST is here. Your professors may assist you. Do not submit applications without having had a few other eyes other than you look at them. Because sometimes we're so passionate about the work that we're doing. Oh my god, I'm going to study snails in Uganda. It's exciting. No, no one else cares. So you need to figure out, you need to figure out how to make that exciting. You know, how do, how do we make that exciting? Are there facts? Are there, you know, how can that knowledge be leveraged in a different way? Can the slime be used as a, a new, you know, a moisturizer for skin? I don't know, but the point is another mind will be able to see gaps in your logic, right? Or opportunities that you may have missed because you were dealing with the details of the application. That's actually a great idea for a film. Well, <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> and then the last thing I would say, do not be afraid to resubmit. So let's say you apply for something um, and you're rejected. I always like to borrow Chris Palmer's phrase because he said that at the meeting we were at, a rejection is an excellent place to begin a beautiful relationship with the program officer. Because it shows that you're in it for the long haul, right? So what did I not do well this year that I can do next year a little bit better? Do you have any feedback for me? Because now the pressure's off, right? And so now that gives us an opportunity to develop a relationship over the course of a year. It gives me an opportunity to wow you and to tell you how special I am and to send you Kodaks of me presenting and to ask for your feedback and to invite you to the special soiree about snails and to really show you that I'm really excited about this topic so that the next time you see my application, ah, you're a little more personally vested in it, right? And in DC, being in this area, you have the opportunity to develop those relationships because many of the, you know, most of your federal funders are going to be here. Right? But we don't take those, that opportunity to develop the relationship with the program officers that we should. Want to be clear, not saying send program officers roses, not saying become stalkers. What I am saying is if they're open to that level of communication and they're open to giving you feedback on what you did wrong, solicit it, take it, implement it, and show that you've listened and that you value them taking that time to talk to you. I hope you got something out of today other than your general kind of overview of Grant Forward. Everyone has my direct information. If you find that you have questions later on, please feel free to reach out to me. Again, my name is Akita Felder, and I'm the Communications and Operations Manager for the Office of Sponsored Programs. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you.